this morning about faith, hope, and love. I was 49 a couple of weeks ago. Can you believe it? Good answer. So thank to each and every one of you all the cards and well wishes. At least three of you. Thank you. As I've gotten older, I've found two things. First of all, without glasses, this text here is blurred. And with glasses, this text here is blurred. So, yeah, there might be lots of this going backwards and forwards. But I found myself looking and thinking about past times. And I think as you get older, you do this, don't you? See, I told you. And I've realized in my 49 years, I've known lots of Christians. I've seen some thrive and go from strength to strength in great power, which is fantastic. I've seen quite a few others who seem to be consistently weak and losing the way and lost. I see many who get mired down in unnecessary problems or avoidable things, sometimes for years or even decades, some people. Seemingly unable to, to press forward, to persevere, to find a way. So how, but the question for us this morning is, how do we stand fast? How do we run the race properly? How do we stay faithful? How do we persevere when things get tough? When I say tough, I don't mean I've burnt the toast and now the car won't start, or tough as in I can't afford the latest iPad. I mean tough as in, if it comes to it, would I die for what I believe? That kind of tough, you know, real tough. So we're going to look at the past and the future today in the context of faith, hope, and love. But, because I am awkward, we're going to do it in reverse order. So it'll be love, hope, and faith. And I'll start talking about love. Uh, the prodigal son. Most of us will know the story of the prodigal son, so I'm not going to read it all, but I will summarize it. This is in Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. And it's a chapter where Jesus tells three parables, and this is the third out of the three. And it's all about things or people being lost, then found. The parable begins by introducing three characters. There's the father and his two sons, an older and a younger son. So to summarize it, the youngest, younger of the two sons demands his share of the father's estate, and the father gives it to him. Shortly after being given all this inheritance, he runs off and squanders all this wealth in wild living, the Bible says. Finding himself destitute and in the middle of a severe famine in the land where he went, he hires himself out to a, a pig farmer. Seeing firsthand that the pigs were eating better than him, he decides to return to his father and he begs to be allowed to serve as a hired, as hired servant on the estate. Luke 15, 20 says this, So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, that's like saying a sin against God, and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Meanwhile, the older son had been faithfully working in the fields for his father. Seeing the father celebrating the return of his brother, his rebellious brother, he felt angry, and he refused to join the celebration. The father pleaded with his older son to try and understand the joy that he felt over the return of what he thought was lost. It was like the youngest son had been dead, and he was alive again. The story concludes with him pleading with his oldest son. But we never know what happened after that. We never, knew, we never know if the older son then went in to join the party. The parable, the parable of the prodigal son is in this context. God sees sinners who come home as his beloved children. He welcomes them. He rejoices. Some things to notice about this. The father divided the inheritance between both sons. It was divided. The share of the estate that a younger son would receive on the death of his father would be one-third, because the older son received two-thirds, a double portion. The Bible talks a lot about double portions. So the older son got more than the younger son. So here, both sons received their inheritance, so it couldn't just be given to the younger, it had to be divided at this point. For some length of time, the one son squandered his, and the other one stayed faithful with it. The older son has already got his inheritance, but he wants to stay with his father, he wants to keep on living with him, which was the right thing to do. So not many days later, the, the younger son ends up feeding pigs, which for a Jew 
is the worst possible thing to do. He repents, comes home, not expecting anything, but his father welcomes the son again. This is not him getting his inheritance back. It doesn't say that. The inheritance was gone. The sad part about the parable is that we never know if the older brother actually goes into the party. He comes back from the field, he hears about the party, but he refuses to go in. The father comes out and compels him to come in and celebrate. Look at all you have, he says to him. All that inheritance, but you need to rejoice over your brother. So the older son has got all the inheritance, all the property, all the money. He's still got that. The younger son's got nothing. So he says, you've got all this, come and celebrate. Rejoice over your brother. You just don't love your brother. That's the problem. You don't forgive him for what he's done. You don't want him to be experiencing the joy of being brought back into the family. It's like you want him to be punished and you're jealous. So the older brother seems like a good person in lots of ways because he's been faithful with inheritance. But perhaps he's proud and perhaps he's arrogant. The humble one is the prodigal son. So for those, for those of us who have served God well, or we think we're serving God well, the question is this. When we're confronted with people being freely forgiven by God's grace, do we rejoice? Do we show our own humility and our own love for others, or do we not like it? Do we think, well, those people have done wrong. They should be punished. Yeah, we've kept faithful to this. We're all right. But look what they've done. They've come back. Yes, that's, that's good. But they should be punished. Is that love? Is that forgiveness? The father forgave a huge amount, but the son, the, the older son, couldn't. The inheritance was not normally distributed until the father's death. So to ask for it early was a great insult to the father. It'd be like saying, I wish you were dead. So upon receiving such a shocking request, the father would be expected at least to beat his son and not give him any inheritance. So Jesus' audience, when he was telling this story, would have been horrified about all this. Horrified that the younger son would ask for this in the first place and that he would kind of demand power over it straight away. In other words, give me my inheritance, give it to me now. And they'd be equally shocked that the father would allow himself to be treated in this way because it just didn't happen. But the father said, okay, why are we talking about this? Because it's about love. The father loved both sons. But he was joyful when his lost son returned. He welcomed him because he loved him. He forgave him because he loved him. There were consequences. A lost inheritance. But he was welcomed back into the family. There's always consequences. If you think you can do whatever you want, and God will accept you back, that's true if your heart is right. There's always consequences. Don't be naive. The father in the story is, of course, God. It's a story of love. But what about the older brother? He already had everything, but he couldn't forgive. He didn't have love. The younger brother deserved to lose everything. He did, because he was an idiot. I know, lots of idiots. Sometimes I see one in the mirror. Unfortunately, I see this in some Christians today, quite a number of Christians today. Unforgiveness. Their love has grown cold. They have the inheritance, have their beliefs, but it's legalistic. It's, I follow the rules, so I'm going to get to heaven. Well, yes, that might be true, but it's not the full picture, is it? I'm going to read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. This is the great chapter by Paul on love. So if Jesus was the pioneer, the visionary, who showed us the way back to the Father, then Paul was like the operations manager, the consolidator, the person that set out the rules, policies, and all the procedures he put those in place so we've got the framework in which we can carry out the instructions of Jesus. So Paul wrote this. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but don't have love, I gain nothing. All of those things there can be counterfeited. Just because you see people doing those things, every single one of them, doesn't mean you're a Christian. It doesn't mean you have love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It isn't proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. 
It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs, even when you burn the tea or forget to buy things from the shop or many, many other things that some of us forget to do. It keeps no record of wrongs. <laughs> not a single one, it says here. <laughs> Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always endures. Endures is an important word here. We're going to come back to that. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in, in part, and we know prophecy in part. But when completeness comes, when the end comes, what is in part disappears. For now, we see only a reflection in the mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then... In the future, I shall know fully. So at this point in the passage, we're looking to the future. And that's important too. We'll come back to that. Now these three things remain. Faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. We know this chapter really well, most of us. But do we really know it? That's the question. Without love for each other, we're missing the point. We are the older brother. The one who can't get over the past hurt or injustice. The one who holds a grudge. We just keep going back to it. Is that you this morning? Is that me? Is there something in the past I just can't let go of? Is that root still there? For many people it is. And if you're struggling with now, perhaps you need to look back to then to see if there's something that you need to let go. It's wrong because it's the opposite that God behaves towards us. Completely the opposite. God is the father in the parable who forgives everything. Number two, hope. So that was love. This is hope. Remember, reverse order. So we're looking today at why some of us weak and struggle and how to remain strong and how that relates to the past and the future. The Bible mentions hope about 130 times. So it's important. It's one of the most important virtues of the Christian life along with faith and love. So I'm going to list some attributes of hope here. I think they speak for themselves. Hope is always in the future and it is never seen. Romans 8 says this, for in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. So if you can see it, you haven't got it. For who hopes for what he sees? For if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Some of us aren't very patient. Are we, Dad? <laughs> hope requires trust in God. We don't see what we're waiting for. And we don't know when it's going to come. But through our trust in God, we're confident it will come. And we wait for it patiently. Second one. Perseverance in our suffering brings hope. This is really easy to read and really hard to do. So I'm going to read it. And it's just a reading, isn't it? But I know that this is really hard to do. Romans 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Do we? Do I? Really? But we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. There's that word again. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. So trials develop our endurance. It teaches us to trust God despite our sufferings. Perseverance helps us to see beyond our current circumstances. To the future that God promised. And that's the point. God has promised us a future. It's really difficult to see when we're going through sufferings. And the sufferings could be lots and lots of different things. Very personal to some people. It's really difficult. Third one. Hope brings joy and peace. Proverbs 10. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. Hope produces joy because you know a wonderful event will happen. And your wait isn't in vain. Next one. Christ is our living hope. Book of Titus chapter 2. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God, the Saviour, Jesus Christ. Christ is our living hope. The fulfilment of everything we wait for in this life. And he's coming again. And that coming again is just as important as when he came the first time. Next one, we have hope for a resurrection. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, 
God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. The resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith. And anything you hear, any preaching that you hear that says that is not the case, is wrong. It's the absolute cornerstone, the foundation. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, if Jesus is not risen, then our faith is empty. And without his resurrection, we have no hope for the next life. But Christ is risen, and we will too. All of these attributes, if you notice, point to the future. Hope is in the future. That's important. So we've got love, which is essential, but let's be honest, really difficult. Do I love everybody? No. I'm being very honest. Do you love everybody? No. <laughs> so love is essential, but it's difficult. Then we've got hope, which is essential, but it's difficult as well. Particularly if you're not sure what you're hoping for or where your hope is. We can hope in lots of different things, and lots of different things and people let us down. We're human. If you're hoping in Boris or Sir Keir, then I'm sorry, but your hope is probably in vain. <laughs> you know, whichever side you vote for. You know, if that is the, the culmination of your hope, it might be a problem. Even if you put your hope in other people, even close friends and family, even loved ones, because we're human, we're not perfect. We will let each other down. So anything that we put our hope in that is not him is a problem. So how do we keep the command to love one another and have hope in the future? So that brings us to faith. Deb prayed about faith this morning, which was helpful. Thank you. I was reading Revelation the other day, Revelation 14, and it's all about some really serious things, really serious things that are going to happen at the end of this age. Things that will test us like never before. I'm not going to go through them, you can read it for yourself. But things that will test us like we've never been tested before. How are we going to cope when these things happen? Verse 12 of Revelation 14 says this. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. So we need endurance to keep his commands and we need to have faith. Those are the two things that it says there. So my question for myself is this. Is my belief in the death and resurrection of Jesus enough to sustain my faith to a point where I'm willing to die for it? Can I keep his commands to love to such an extent that I can endure persecution? If you constantly struggle with sin or habits or just being a weak Christian, then perhaps, and hear me out, Perhaps it's because your faith is pointing in the wrong direction. Let me explain. Most preaching, or a lot of preaching, connects obedience, that's keeping his commands, and faith solely, in other words only, to a past event, the crucifixion. The problem is, that's not the way the New Testament does it. So, hear me out. Let's define faith, first of all. Hebrews 11, 1 says this. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. Hebrews 11, same chapter, verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. That's really strong, isn't it? Not difficult, impossible. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who seek him. So faith is absolutely necessary. It doesn't say that without faith it's difficult. He says without faith it's impossible to please God. There's no substitute for it. Faith is the, the rock-solid foundation of hope. It's about things hoped for. And that's a future-orientated thing. Remember we've said hope is always in the future. Not a past, test, past tense thing. It's also, it says here, about a reward, a promise of something wonderful in the future. Before I read some verses to back up what I'm saying, just think about normal life. When the kids were younger, if I asked them to tidy their room, they would do it for a reward. Because they're tough like that. They'll be less likely to do it if it had said, because I played football with you three months ago, can you tidy your room today? They're not going to do it. It's just human nature. Past tense events are a weak motivation for present tense obedience. Future faith is a strong motivation. So if you do this, then I'll do that for you. That's a strong motivation. 
People who go to work get paid for what they've done. The early church preaching and teaching was not so much about what had happened, but more about what will happen. They would talk about what had happened, but that would be to set the context. It would be the springboard to say what's coming next. Now, if this sounds to you like I'm not caring about the cross, nothing could be further from the truth. I'm not reducing its importance. That's not the case at all. The cross, as we've celebrated this morning, changed everything. It was the turning point. And we all need to come to the cross and see and know and understand what it meant and what it means. We need to remember it and be thankful for it continually. But if we only focus on the first coming of Jesus without focusing on the second coming of Jesus, which hasn't yet happened, we only get half the picture. They are completely linked. One without the other doesn't work. If we believe that Jesus paid for everything on, paid for everything on the cross and we don't have to do anything else to be effective people of God apart from believing that, then there's no need for the rest of the New Testament, is there? If that's the case, then why are these, all these other books in the New Testament? Why doesn't it stop after the Gospels? They're full of instructions, sometimes known as imperatives or commands. Do these things, don't do these things. So the new believer, imagine that's you, accepts that he or she is a sinner, he needs forgiveness, and that Jesus died and rose again to sort all that out. Absolutely. He's grateful and he won't ever forget it. But many people fall away. We've said this already. Many people fall away. You know people who have fallen away. Or they really struggle to live a you know, strong Christian life. Why? If Jesus paid for everything on the cross, why do I need to follow all these other commands? It's all been paid for already. So why? Because, in my view, the gospel that is just a historical thing is not the full gospel. There has to be a future. There's got to be a future. What are we saved for? What are we saved to? So why are the weak Christians? Why are those people, some people that fall away? I remember a friend of mine from many years ago in our youth group back at Junction 10 who got saved in an amazing way. I was really on fire for everything. Put the rest of us to shame. Shared the gospel everywhere. School, college, whatever age. Amazing. Then, tough times hit. And they left. Fairly quickly. Suddenly. I caught up with them a few years later and asked what had happened. I still believe, was the answer, but their life was completely different. There were no outward signs of living as a Christian at all. Why? Here's my theory. If you were raised in what I've heard call a therapeutic preaching environment, do you like that? Yeah. Like some of the mega churches, then the gospel makes you feel good about yourself. It's all love and forgiveness and me and tight jeans and drinking nice coffee. Yeah, it's me. And this is partly right, apart from the tight jeans and coffee. It's all about love and forgiveness. It's partly right. If, however, your experience is in more of a formal church setting, your view is probably more legalistic. Jesus' death legally dealt with my sin and my guilt and made me right with God to get me into heaven. Partly right. Both of these scenarios make you feel good, or at least make you feel right at the time. But for some people... It just wears off. Let's be honest, it wears off. That decision that you made and the feelings that you had, it wears off. Feelings fade. There's no motivation to carry on past that initial point. Let me read some passages from the New Testament. These were written after Jesus' death and resurrection, and they are instructions and commands to the believers, to us, to the church. 1 Peter 4 says this, The end of all things is near. Therefore, or because of that fact, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. So when the in-laws come round, don't grumble. I never do, and never have. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, 
as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If someone speaks, you should do it as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, since you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So, love each other, that's a command, it's an imperative. Be hospitable, that's a command, do it. Use your gifts, that's a command, you need to do it. Rejoice, that's a command. Why? Because the end of all things is near, that's what it says, and his glory will be revealed. That's future. So these instructions, why should you obey them? Because something is coming. It doesn't say something has happened here, something is coming. 1 Corinthians 1. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. That's future. He will keep you firm till the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's future motivation. The reward here is to be found blameless. Future. 1 Corinthians 9. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. That's a command. Why? They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Future reward. Future motivation. The passage that we read earlier all about love was all about motivation in the future. For now we see in a mirror dimly. In other words, we don't know everything yet. But then, in the future, we'll see face to face. Now, I know in part. I've got half the story. I know bits. Then... I shall know fully. It's all pointing to the future. In 1 Corinthians, Paul doesn't talk about the cross until chapter 15, where he reminds them of what they first believed. And I'd say this, many of us, including me, when we do a Bible reading plan, we have verses from here, there, and everywhere, just bits. And we get a great exegesis on that particular verse. What we don't do very often is read whole books through to get the context of it. What happened first, second, third, fourth? So in Corinthians, it's chapter 15 before Paul even mentions the cross. That's quite extraordinary. I never realized that before. My challenge to you is to check this out for yourself. Read this for yourself. Find almost any passage in the New Testament with instructions, these imperatives, commands, and look at the motivation for it. Why? They said do this. Why? They said don't do that. Why? Nine out of ten ish will be for a future motivation something that not has not yet happened and it'll be linked to the future motivation which is the second coming of jesus and we don't talk about it enough it's going to happen that is why according to the new testament we do all these things not just for what is done although the importance of that cannot be overstated but it's the foundation It's about the kingdom of God. It's about enduring to the end. Jesus came to proclaim the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of the crucifixion or the kingdom of the virgin birth or any other kingdom. He came to proclaim the kingdom of God. That's future. If you're a Christian this morning, the cross changed everything for you. Everything. It's an event happened 2,000 years ago that became real for you the moment you accepted it. And you can probably remember that day, the year, the time that it happened. And you should cherish that moment. Be thankful for it. Rejoice in it. Remember it. Honour it, like we did this morning. But we should do it ourselves individually as well. Its significance is eternal and it changed everything. But it's not the end of the journey. It didn't finish there. It started there. The cross is the starting point for us. It points to the second coming. The second coming of Jesus adds clarity and substance and meaning and beauty to the first coming of Jesus. We need faith to endure life's tough times and we will need faith to endure what is coming. We have faith to believe what Jesus did for us on the cross, absolutely, but the direction of our faith should now be pointing forwards motivating us to have hope and love. 
Love's the greatest thing because God loved us. God is love. That's why it says in that passage, the greatest of these is love because God is love. In the same way that I am human, God is love. I can't completely grasp that. But that's why it's the greatest thing. Without that, without God being love, we wouldn't be saved in the first place. So that's why it says the greatest thing. But without faith, we cannot please God or know the God of love. Without hope, we wouldn't endure in our faith until we meet him face to face. It's a wonderful, wonderfully entwined trinity of attributes that we can build our lives upon. You can't separate one from the other. We, if we're Christians this morning, are people of eternity, of the future. We thank God for what we did, what he did, and we look forward to what he will do. Jesus bore the cross, yeah, but he's also going to wear a crown. And that day is coming. We're not sure when. It might not be far. That is why we should, that is what will keep us strong and motivated. That is what makes us love each other and gives us hope. We need to become a people of the kingdom, a people of the future, a people of eternity. Mm-hmm.